Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled you're here with us today. We're going to have a wonderful conversation and learn what English Rose Residential Homes is doing fantastic and how that might be able to help you and your loved ones as well. If you liked our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, which you can download on any of your favorite uh, platforms there. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer's Speaks is about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to have real conversations with real people. So we interview people all over the world, from those diagnosed, family and friends that care for them, as well as business professionals in all different uh, in all different capacities, singers, songwriters, movie directors, authors, um, kids making a difference. Uh, we think we can't make sustainable change in this arena unless we're inclusive. And so that's our goal. Today is a live show. So if you'd like to call in and ask a question or make a comment, that number is 323-870-4602. That's 323-870-4602. Now, I always like to do a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our guest. So I want to give a shout out to Picnic Health. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they are a new um, Alzheimer's research program and that is really important. And what they do is Picnic Health collects and digitizes all of your medical records into one online account. And then you can consent to share anonymized data from your records with medical researchers. And by examining this real-world data from medical records, researchers can actually find answers that can't be found sometimes in clinical trials. So know that your information is important and feel free to share your story. When you go to picnichealth.com forward slash speaks and sign up, you'll get $25. And if you are caring for somebody with Alzheimer's, you can sign up on their behalf as well, as long as you have legal authority to do that. Again, that's picnichealth.com forward slash speaks and get your $25 and help push research forward. Now, in this time of COVID, I always like to share a couple of support groups that I'm involved with. One is Arthur's Memory Cafe, and we have been virtual all during COVID, and we uh, meet the fourth and second Wednesday of each month at, uh, that would be 2 o'clock Eastern, 1 Central, noon Mountain Time, and 11 a.m. Pacific Time, and all are welcomed. Uh, so that'll just be tomorrow when we're meeting. And then also, once a month, I work with Brookdale North Oaks uh, here in Minnesota and the Shoreview Parks and Rec Community Center, and we do a Caregiver Connect. And we normally meet in person, but last month, due to COVID, we ended up meeting virtually, and we've decided to do the same here because Omicron is is still uh, high risk um, here in Minnesota. So if you are interested in either of those, you can email me at radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. That's radio at alzheimerspeaks.com. Or for the Brookdale one, you can call 763 913 Six one four zero. We'd love to have you join us. Now, last um, we are going to hear from the Footbar Walker, and actually, who is going to be talking about them is the the wonderful experts in senior care 
the Adaptive Equipment and Caregiver Corner. We're going to hear from them in just a minute. I do want to remind people also to check out Dementia Map. Dementia Map is our global resource directory. We have over 150 categories. Um, we've tried to make it really easy to discern the information that you need. We've got a glossary of terms because I know when my mom got diagnosed, I didn't know any of them. And uh, it also features a blog and a calendar of events, which many of them are free. So go to DementiaMap.com and check it out. If you are a service provider uh, or have authored a book or have a blog, um, everyone is welcome. Just reach out to me at radio at Alzheimer's Speaks, and I'll step you through how to do that. And that includes people with dementia. There's a lot of great information that they have gathered from the lived experience on there as well. So let's hear from the foot bar walker, and we will be right back. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The foot bar walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The foot bar walker was designed not only to assist the patient, but also the caregiver. It's like having a portable pull bar everywhere you go. Patients have more control of their motion and pain management, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. Caregivers, put your foot down and quit hurting your own health. No matter which side of the foot bar walker you're on, it's a win-win. Call 731-924-4444 and visit our factory showroom in Paris, Tennessee, or visit us online at thefootbarwalker.com. Well, I have to apologize because I pushed the wrong button, but I'm not going to play the commercial twice there. That was not the Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner peeps. Um, but check them out because they have amazing videos that they do on all sorts of adaptive equipment. You can visit them at eacorner.com, and I'll make sure I get that fixed for next time. Well, let's let's. Uh, introduce our guest today. For those of you that don't know, English Rose is a set of residential homes here in Minnesota, and they are really focused on the well-being uh, approach to care. And I can tell you personally, they really take this seriously. Um, they know that the approach to care is critical, and that is why they teach their staff using both tools and training that they have personally developed. English Rose has been providing residential care for those with memory loss since 1997, and they have experienced how many individuals with memory loss thrive in a smaller scale home environment. Um, and it really does help uh, focus on that, that well-being of the individuals. Um, the challenge with well-being, as we all know, is everybody is individual, and they're very um, different things. And so they know that they have to really look at the factors um, on an individual basis, on a personal basis for everyone to figure out what's going to contribute to their personal happiness. And unlike a purely medical model approach to health, English Rose uh, Care Model, again, centers on this whole well-being. And as much as we don't like that silver bullet, no, it doesn't exist in our heart. And we know that a one-size-all doesn't work when it comes to dementia. And to me, that is where English Rose really shines. It has this common sense approach to focusing on individuals' well-being. And there's this deep understanding of what makes somebody happy. You know, what makes them comfortable? So today we're going to hear from two of English Rose's uh, staff who are dementia experts, Katie Reinheimer, who is their director of quality of life, and Zach Parlier, who is the director of team member development. And English Rose, again, um, is just has this wonderful model of well-being that we're going to be talking about and getting some examples of how it positively affects their residents. So welcome, Zach. How are you doing today? 
Doing wonderful, Lori. Thanks for having us. And Katie, you as well. I'm I'm thrilled that you're able to join us uh, here today. So I hope your day is kicking off well. So thank you again for, for being with us, Katie. Absolutely. So I always start out with all of my guests. I ask them one basic question. And I'm going to throw this first to Katie, and that is, have you been personally touched in your own family circle of friends by dementia? Yes, I have. It um, was my maternal grandmother, and she was diagnosed with dementia over 30 years ago, which um, we later found out was Alzheimer's. So I was in my impressionable youth and growing up and watching my family to care for her and navigate the healthcare system, which did not offer everything that we can offer today at that time. Okay. And how about you, Zach? Yes. um, When I was about 12 years old, my grandfather was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and my mother is an RN, and just from the get-go did not want to put him in any kind of assisted living or nursing home facility. And so she actually moved him from South Carolina up to our home in Minnesota, um, in the Wanamingo area, and we took care of my grandpa for six years. Um, from the time I was 14 on, I became his primary caregiver, uh, partnering with my mother, and uh, we were his care team for those six years and, um, you know, took him through his day and his routine and definitely was impacted by growing up with Alzheimer's disease, I would say. Okay. Well, great. I have to I have to um, thank you both for sharing that, but I have to make a comment on you, Zach. Where the heck is Wataminga? I've lived in Minnesota all my life, and I've not, <laughs> and I've not heard that. So is that south or north? You north are north? not <laughs> – you're not alone in not having heard of Wanamingo. It is, um, you know, they talk about those one stoplight towns. I don't even think there's a stoplight in Wanamingo, um, not to mention a stop sign. Um, it's, it's just north of Rochester, probably about half an hour north of Rochester, um, barely off of Highway 52. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thanks for that clarification. Just get a little more <laughs> yeah, ge- no geography in my life there. Um, Katie, I want to ask you, if you wouldn't mind explaining to our audience, what are residential homes for individuals with with memory care, and how how do they differ from the memory care housing option? Because you know, yours are yours are like an everyday house. Um, you know, they're not these big facilities that you walk through with the hallway. So, um, can you tell us what you see as the difference? Absolutely. So, residential. Um, memory care in our homes in particular are regular houses like families live in that our residents would have grown up in. Um, And we have our number of residents that can stay in each one of our homes is lower. We can have six people living in each home and we decorate them um, in a way that is reminiscent to things that they would um, remember from growing up. Each resident is able to decorate their own suites within the home as well and in a way that makes them feel comfortable while they're living here. And one of the biggest ways I think that we can differentiate from other memory care environments or larger environments is our size. Our size is really conducive to helping each individual navigate their journey with their specific disease in a way that helps them to be able to communicate better with us for us to be able to have the space in the home where we can um, help somebody if they just need a little bit of a wait time from the group, which happens. We all need kind of our our one-on-one or alone time as well. Um, It just is the small environment. It's individualized care. It is the best that I have seen in my years of working with people in memory care um, really is the residential. It's the way to go. Well, and how many years have you been with them? Because that has a, to me, that makes a big statement that something is right there that you would stay with the company for as long as you have. So do you mind sharing with people how long you've been there? Not at all. I'm going on 19 years this June, um, and 
English Rose as a company, we are in our 20, starting our 25th year, which I think too also uh, validates the the way in which we not only teach and train our caregivers, um, but it says a lot to the individuals that we are serving to and those families that continue to seek out um, what we're able to do for their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. I I have, um, you know, been to a few of your homes over the years and I've always been impressed of, because it feels like a home. It feels like a family, and to me, those are two of the the biggest differentiating factors. There seems to be this camaraderie in a in a smaller group in a in a home like in a true home like setting. Um, mm-hmm. And so, for me, that's one of the big differences I see. Um, I'd also like to ask you about what exactly is the English Rose approach and can you um can you kind of show us through storytelling maybe what the experience is like for an individual living with dementia and their families and staff as well sure so the approach in our in the experience of somebody that's living at an english rose home um it really starts from the very beginning it is learning who that person is not only now in their disease process, but who they were before they were diagnosed. Um, Things that were important to them, uh, down from what they did for a living, you know, their children, where they grew up, um, do they like to travel, just getting to know their life story and their life history, and being able to involve everybody that's still actively involved in their life, their spouses, sometimes, now it is a parent, maybe, that is helping to care for some of our residents um, and their children to be able to help expand their experience. And it's looking at how we can individualize everything that we do for them um, based off of maybe their diagnosis, too. You know, somebody that has a Lewy body diagnosis is going to need different support than somebody that has um FTD or um, Alzheimer's. We need to really create this experience based around that e- that individual person, um, taking them out into the community, doing the things that they still enjoy doing, having them still feel and have purpose every day is so important. I think it's important for all of us. We all want a purpose in life and, and want something that we are doing um, daily and we are teaching, which Zach can talk about um, a little bit more in detail, how to navigate that world for our caregivers so that they truly do understand dementia and the ways that we can approach and help support um, our residents. And it's involving their family members. They truly know their loved one the best, and they can help guide us in their care routine that they have created for them at home uh, prior to coming to live with us, Um, the things that they enjoy doing and how they have adapted um, the ability to continue to do those things for their loved ones as well. Um, It's really a team effort all around in the caregiving team. And we often, too, find ourselves supporting our families through this journey as well. Um, We do like to keep our residents with us through the end of life and that includes hospice care and what does that look like and how do we support them Um, because this english rose becomes their loved one's home and we want them to be involved and be here and feel comfortable in their home as well Um, there's so many stories i could tell you i could take up five hours probably over the 19 years of different residents, but I have a few that really do stick out. And one in particular was a gentleman that lived with us. Um, He moved into one of our homes and um, he had Lewy body dementia and he was coming from his own home. His wife had recently passed away um, from cancer and he was just needing support and um, needing to have care there for him around the clock so that we could help him continue on in his journey. And he needed to have a meeting with me. 
every morning when I would come into my office. And he'd be waiting at the door with his pad of paper and his pen and want to schedule me into his calendar. Mm. And so we did. We met every day. And he would report on how he felt the caregivers were doing um, because he was a businessman. So we always had this uh, inside detail that he was looking for and was looking at performance and, um, you know, so-and-so wasn't so busy last night. You might want to talk to them and see what they were doing, he would tell me. (laughs) And, you know, we, we would go on long walks with him because he was still really young and healthy and needing to just get out of the house and to move about and to exercise. And he would also use me as like a confidant. He, he would confide in me how he was feeling about his disease. And when he could feel things changing, he would confide in me about that and wouldn't want to burden his children with these details of planning his funeral, even though it was already planned, he would want me to sit with him for a little while and plan the funeral and make sure that I was conveying his wishes to his kids um, because he didn't want to burden him. And that's another way in which we can differentiate ourselves from other environments is we all spend time with our residents and do what they need. They really, truly guide our day. Mm-hmm. Zach, anything you want to add as far as the English rules approach or a couple of experiences you've had yourself? Certainly, yeah. I think, I mean, just to reiterate the things that Katie was saying about, you know, this is just a home. Each of our environments, it is a home. It is a physical environment that is similar to environments that they would have lived in or would be living in, would probably prefer to live in over a larger facility, like you said, with the long hallways and the sterile um, environment there. I I feel like the word I hesitate to use because I think it's overused in the dementia space, but I think our approach is that normalcy is possible. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, these individuals living with dementia, be it Alzheimer's or Lewy body, Um, normalcy is possible for them and they can still do the things that they enjoy doing. They can still live a life that has some semblance of what they would be doing otherwise. Um, And so I I do think that the physical space, it's familiar. You're waking up in a bedroom. You're not waking up in a room that can look like a hospital room. I spent many years in those large environments, uh, nursing homes, memory cares, And that was always my thought was that you have these people who are waking up every morning and have no idea where they are, perhaps. Um, Mm -hmm. And you kind of assume the worst if you think you're in a hospital bed or you're in a room in the hospital, whereas our residents are waking up in their bedrooms, in their beds often that they may be brought from home or from wherever they're coming from, and they're seeing their things. I think that that's a big part of that familiarity and that normalcy is they're seeing their art that hung in their home, they're seeing their furniture that they enjoyed sitting in, they're seeing all of these things that are, you know, really have become part of who they are um, over the years. And I just think that that's crucial to um, normalcy and to feeling like you still are that person that you've always been. Um, And to just speak to examples of that, I mean, like Katie said, I've probably, Katie definitely probably has more stories than I, but I I like to think I can go toe to toe with her. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But I have all these stories of of these residents that, you know, they, they were deemed in other environments where they come from or came from as wanderers and exit seekers. And anytime they would try a door, they'd be trying to, trying to go, they would be redirected. And here we teach our caregivers that when you have a resident who is trying the door, today would be a bad example of that, Um, but if you have a resident who's trying the door, you should open the door for them and go outside with them and and get some fresh air. Of course, with it being negative five today, that's why it would would be a bad example, but um, (laughs) going outside and getting that fresh air and, and just not having that sense of imprisonment where every time you try a door, someone pulling you away from that door or telling you to go elsewhere, or you open that door and an alarm goes off, um, that, of course, is going to have that feeling of imprisonment. Um, and I just think that our approach is, is everyone who works at English Rose really believes that it's their job to help navigate through the disease process 
and, and help that person, empower them to be who they've always been through, um, like Katie was talking about, doing the things that they enjoy doing. Um, and again, just I, we'll talk more about well-being, I'm sure, but just that full picture of the person, the entire story, and not just focusing on, you know, the physical. Yep. Well, you know, when you talked about normalcy, I, I thought for sure you were going to not say that term, but the term person-centered care, which drives me bananas, because I really think that <laughs> one is over, overused and underdelivered. And, you know, my experience with English Rose is, uh, and this is the term that that I feel more comfortable with, is relationship-based care. You really know your peeps. You know who they are. You know their likes, their dislikes. I mean, they're true human beings and, and friends. I mean, there, there's, you can see the relationships when you walk in the door mm-hmm. and, you, and you see staff engaged. And to me, that's one of the, the biggest differences. And not that other communities can't have that, um, but I find that it's more rare um, for, you know, all staff to have those just intense yet comfortable interactions um and i am you know in a smaller setting i just think it's it's easier you've got less people to have to know and um you know it's 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 easier to be able to to pay attention there's less distractions i mean i can go go on and on with that so Uh thank you for for the detail on that zach why don't you tell us about the well-being model um at english rose and and how was that developed and why Certainly. Well, I, I have to say, first of all, about person-centered care. I love what you said, over, over-promise, under-delivered, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that's definitely, you know, that philosophy has been around for a long time. And I think that that's where um, I think our well-being model is, it is person-centered care, but it is going to have the delivery to that end. I think person-centered care, as it's become more relevant and widespread as a philosophy, um, you know, it is not necessarily covering the emotional and the um, just the overall emotional and layered and nuanced piece of really getting to the core of who that person is. I think person-centered care as a movement is important because it does. It empowers choice. It makes sure that, you know, that individual still has human rights. But where we take that to a 2.0 is, is with this well-being model, which is to recognize Um, well-being is being more than physically well. I think that that's where when we think well-being and memory care or in elder care in general, I think that we think about physical wellness and safety, you know, when you hear that word well-being. Um, And that's that's very normal in those environments to focus solely upon the physical or primarily upon the physical. Um, Cleaning up someone who's been incontinent, having a toileting schedule. I hate that word, but it's a word that we still use um, in a lot of environments skin breakdown prevention, medicinal interventions. Um, There are all of these things that are very important, but they're just a small piece to the puzzle that is, you know, living a life with Alzheimer's disease and and well-being, having that through that disease process. Um, Our well-being model has five different components to it. Physical well-being is one of those components. And so we just recognize well-being as being in a physical wellness, but also having intellectual well-being, which is going to be that um, ability to still have complex discussions and to be able to still talk about current events and watch the news and explore those topics of interest that they've always had. Um, Still learning, you know, it's an interesting thing to talk about learning with dementia, but it's something that you still get the excitement of learning and, and learning new facts that we might not remember later today. But in the moment, it is exciting and it's interesting and it's intriguing. And so having activities like trivia and things like that that are going to stretch our residents' minds and abilities to still have an intellectual connection to life, Um, problem solving, having them be part of, you know, coming up with solutions to maybe problems that they're having throughout the day and empowering them to have that choice. Um, and then on top of that, still getting out into the community and going to the Institute of Arts or going to the Arboretum and learning about different things, going to museums and uh, just having those outings out in the community to explore cultural and community aspects. Um, next, we would talk about purpose and how purpose is so important for these individuals living with dementia. 
Um, and, and that purpose comes from, I like to talk about how when you complete a task and you just want to dust your hands off and feel good about something that you've accomplished, um, making sure that our residents are still able to help with meal prep, help with setting a table, help do these tasks that they've done their entire lives, um, managing a household. We have a resident in one of our homes who she is very busy all day and she's going room to room and she's rearranging things and she's taking photos down in her room and putting up other photos and she's busy all day long. And it's, it's, it's a productive busy because it's that sense of purpose and it's that helping out around the house that she, you know, holds very dear walking up to a, caregiver who's doing dishes and standing next to them, rolling up her sleeves, sticking her hands in the dishwater as if to help do the dishes. That's that sense of purpose and, and still feeling like you're contributing to uh, your world. Um, mm -hmm. Shopping, laundry, getting those tasks done are all part of that purpose that comes with well-being. And then lastly for purpose, you know, looking nice, looking good, feeling good, having makeup done every morning, having hair looking nice, um, you know, cleanliness is so important. I think of a resident we had a couple of years ago now who she had her makeup done every morning. And I, if I could look at or give you a visualization of purpose, I see her looking in the mirror and she would always do this little shimmy when she liked what she saw, you know, because the makeup <laughs> looked good. And that's that <laughs> sense of dignity and purpose and still feeling like yourself. Um, and then third, we have social well-being which would be kind of what it sounds like, those relationships that you have with people in your life, your family, your friends, um, sharing stories about your lifetime, sharing stories about growing up in a different time, those intergenerational connections that they have with our caregivers. Um, I, I genuinely believe through my time at English Rose, I have had, I've made some of the best friendships I've had in my lifetime with people living with dementia. And I think that that is that's crucial when it comes to that well-being component of of just having those relationships, like you talked about, Lori. Um, mm -hmm. Household friendships, getting to know the residents in the homes that they're living in. We have a number of residents who are retired nurses, and one thing I've learned about nurses is that even though you retire as a nurse, you are always still that nurse, and you're always caring for people. And they want to care for their housemates and they see someone who looks uncomfortable or someone who's having a, a moment of, of emotion and they're comforting them and asking them how they can help and they're there with each other. Um, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. And that comes from those relationships and being in this kind of village like setting. And, you know, lastly would be birthdays and holidays and things like that. Celebrating tradition in a way that you've celebrated tradition your entire life. Um, for Christmas, we had a resident who had these recipes that um, she made every single Christmas for her family, and it was making sure that we had those recipes available to the caregivers to be able to make those things for her to share with her housemates, for her to share with the caregivers, and still have that connection and that feeling of family. Lastly, for our well-being model, we have spiritual well-being, and I, I personally think spiritual well-being is probably where we miss the mark most in a lot of settings where, you know, I, I think that we still hold dear the things like religion and, and having those outings and things like that. But I do feel that in those environments, you have one person who um, is responsible for all these people. In, in environments that I worked with 60 plus residents, you had one activities assistant who was responsible for making sure that that um, you know, that engagement was happening, whereas we expect it from all of our caregivers. Um, spiritual well-being is not just religion. It is not just a faith background. It is really your connection to who you are as a human being. And it's being energized by nature, being energized by, by hearing music that you've listened to your entire lifetime, being able to meditate and, and reflect daily in ways that you've done through your entire life. And then again, I would, I would group community into that as well, where having a sense of community, whether it be through um, neighborhoods where you grew up or philanthropic um, endeavors, spiritual well-being, again, I think is one of the most important, if not the most important. And I do have one story I'll, I'll share, and I, I know I'm going lost here, but I have one story I'll share about spiritual well-being and, and just the beauty of, of those moments. Um, we had a resident living in one of our environments who 
he was a very anxious gentleman and, and would do a lot of pacing in the house and walk from one end of the house to the next. He was living with early onset Alzheimer's. And when he would become anxious, it was best to go outside and walk with him. And it, with our homes being in these neighborhoods in Edina, um, you can just go out and walk with your residents and, and get that exercise, get that fresh air. And it was early in the year. I believe it was April, so it was still a little chilly, and we both had our coats on, and we're walking outside. And I will never forget this in my, my caregiving experience and in my life. Um, this gentleman, you could feel his energy change over time of just walking and um, exercising and being outside and being away from maybe the overstimulation that he was experiencing. And he began to pray. And it was, it was the most amazing thing to me because he, it was very clear. It was very um, obvious that he was praying and he put his hand on my shoulder and it was uh, just one of those very, I don't know, it just felt very impactful to me. And he wasn't, he was praying a prayer of gratitude and he was um, talking about nature and he was talking about how beautiful of a day it was and how blue the sky was and the grass and for our bodies. He kept saying, thank you for our bodies and for the opportunity there. And just all I could think of is, as this man is, is praying and, and having this prayer of gratitude, all I could think of was that this man is living with Alzheimer's disease at, at 60 some years old. And he still has that gratitude in his heart for all of these things that are, are much larger than we are when it comes to, again, nature and, and being um, a human being in this world. And just I think that that I'm not I'm not here to say that that wouldn't happen in another environment, but I think that it would happen in an environment like English Rose a lot more frequently, since that is what we're in pursuit of. We're in pursuit of that experience for our residents in whatever shape or form that they can have that experience. We're in pursuit of that every single day for them. Mm hmm. Well, you know, I, I love the model because, you know, the intellectual, the purpose, the or the intellectual, the physical, the social and the spiritual, they all meld into purpose. And so often we forget to ask what gave a person purpose before? What made them happy? What made them comfortable? I mean, just such simple questions, but we don't always cover that. And to me, that's absolutely critical. Um, to find that. So what a beautiful story on that. Um, mm. You know, you, you kind of gave us an example of how the English Rose approach um, made a difference with your residents, but did you have anything else that you wanted to add, Zach? Because I, I also want to ask that to Katie. Yes, certainly. I'll share uh, just two more brief stories about residents that, that benefited from our environment. And, and as I've thought about that, I do think that you know, these are residents who would have struggled in other environments that I've worked uh, at in the past. I really feel that way. Um, and this one woman, she came to us after having a significant stroke. Um, she had been living with Alzheimer's disease, and it was definitely escalated by this vascular component. And she moved into our environment, and four months after she moved into one of our homes, she was packing every single morning because she was going home. Today was the day she was going home. And that's been one of our more, one of my more challenging residents that it's been more difficult to find well-being for somebody like that. Um, and, and some of the things we did for this individual was we knew, her family knew that she loved to garden. That was something that was so important to her was gardening. And she could tell you the Latin name of every plant you asked her about. She was very, <laughs> very passionate about gardening on a uh, on an intellectual level and on that uh, the actual gardening uh, level as well. And what her family did was they came in with her personal gardener and they planted a garden in our backyard. Um, we have beautiful, beautiful gardens in all of our homes, but there was a little patch of yard that they had a vision for a garden that would hold all of her favorite plants. And they planted this beautiful garden one spring and it's still there today. And they planted lavender so that you could have these kind of sensory type activities for her the further she advanced into her disease. They planted um, lemon ball for the same kind of reason. Um, she could go out into this garden whenever she wanted and be surrounded by these plants and, and the nature that is so, was so uh, integral to her spiritual well-being. Um, and on top of that, she also raised alpaca, and that's something you could talk to her for hours about. Um, I know more about 
alpaca and the quality of their wool than I ever <laughs> thought that I would know. <laughs> and that's something that her family did a wonderful job of doing was bringing her wool and bringing her skeins of yarn for her to um, sort and for her to put together. She sold the yarn years prior to coming to live at English Rose. And so she was always preparing the wool to be sold. And the more that we surrounded her with these things that were just so crucial and so integral to who she was as a person, the less of that perseveration and focus on moving and going back home was happening. Mm -hmm. um, one last story for, for this individual is she was a teacher. She loved to teach, not only in a classroom. I believe she taught middle school, um, but she loved to teach any of the younger people, being caregivers um, that were working in the home, and she would teach them how to do countless things. I will never forget how to fold a fitted sheet, which until I met this woman, I did not think that it was possible to fold a fitted sheet. And to this day, <laughs> I still fold fitted sheets the way that she taught me. Um, and it was her ability to show you this is the right way to do it. And she had such a style, and you could see that just being part of who she was as a person, that desire to teach and show younger people the right way of doing things. And then the last individual I'll just talk about is a gentleman who lived in one of our homes who he was a, a traditional patriarch of, you know, 70, 80 years ago. And one thing that we learned early in his time with us was that he needed to make sure that every door in the home was locked before he went to bed. And that touched me because my grandfather was the same way, um, where that, that, uh, that safety and security and taking care of people was part of who he was. And he would not be comfortable and, and would actually really be anxious if he didn't have an opportunity to make sure the house was secured, make sure the windows were locked, make sure everything was okay. And I think that that's important as, as, as him being a man from his generation and, and still being able to feel that way, still feeling like he could contribute in that traditional protector kind of role that he always had as a father and as a husband. And I will never forget this gentleman and how he was a very small man in stature and whenever you'd shake his hand, it was always the firmest handshake, and he would do everything he could to either stand up or sit up nice and tall. And I just can't, can't help but reiterate enough how amazing it was to see this gentleman who, again, he'd been living with Lewy body dementia for many, many years, and we were still able to find those little things that allowed him to feel like that man that he has always been. So I, I do think that our well-being approach and our, our presence is the word that we like to use for it and trying to find the core of who that person is and navigate through their disease to get to that person and help them feel that way and have those experiences that they need to have. Um, I do think that uh, it, it makes a huge difference in these people's lives. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Katie, I'm going to ask you if you have anything you want to add. I can't believe we're down to only 15 minutes left and I have a bunch of questions, but I, I want to see if you have any other examples that you want to give on that, on uh, what you've seen. I could give a million of them, but Zach did such a wonderful job, and I think it's important for us to share the other things, or some of our other information, too, so you can have at it, Lori. Okay, sounds good. So, Zach, I'm going to go back to you about, um, you know, training seems to be, well, staffing seems to be an issue in a lot of places, but, but training um, and, and getting your staff to focus on the, the right things, you know, in terms of getting to know people. How are you guys, how are you guys doing that? Um, and, and, you know, is it, is it different um, in terms of, of really getting them to pay attention that this stuff is important. You're dealing with, with, with beautiful mm -hmm. human beings. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I do think that the training and the onboarding process is, is kind of where the rubber meets the road because Katie and I can sit here and talk about uh, well-being and, and how, you know, wonderful and, and how impactful it can be when done well, but it is passing that on to our caregivers and helping them be successful that I think is, is the most important thing when it comes to this uh, model that we have here at English Rose. And so I think in a word, our training is intentional. Um, I mentioned briefly that I, I worked as a CNA for years in nursing homes and high school and later, and the training was never intentional. 
Um, I, I remember the first nursing home I worked in, I was told by the gentleman who was training me um, in the, in, you know, in the in-person, on-the-floor kind of training, um, I was told that uh, I, I'm going to give you a do as I tell you, not as I do kind of experience. And that was day one in a nursing home. Um, and this is someone who they had training other caregivers in how to complete the job of a nursing assistant. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. I'll never forget that. Um, but I think our training is extremely intentional. And I think our classroom trainers go above and beyond to make learning interesting. We don't have our caregivers sitting watching videos. That was always my experience with sitting and watching long, dry, monotonous videos um, that always seemed very dated. Um, all of our learning is in person in a classroom with one of our leaders. Um, that includes our eight hours of nursing training and eight hours of dementia training on top of that. So I think our training is very intentional. And we really make it clear from the get-go that we take this very seriously and that we are in constant pursuit of well-being. And that is your benchmark. That is what we're in constant pursuit of. Um, and I think that becomes very clear in how intentional our training all is. Uh, and I think part of the whole training bit is walking the talk. You know, our, sometimes people have trainers and they're in and they're out, but they're they're not mentoring. Um, they're not they're not mm. really doing what they're teaching all the time, mm-hmm. or it's not seen. And and I think that can be a big ouch. Or even having an openness to have a conversation of, you know, gosh, I, I tried what you told me. It's not working. You know, what other suggestions? Or am I doing it wrong? Or you know, um, maybe you need another approach. But I think when you have this this kind of relation-based care model, this well-being model, you're open to being more flexible because, like you said, mm-hmm. it, it, this isn't a one-size-fits-all thing when it comes to dementia. And I think when you have that environment of openness and there is no wrong question to ask because you you realize they're trying to do better they they've recognized hey this isn't working that's a good thing where i think in in some companies people are afraid to say it's not working or they have said it repeatedly and no one responds Mm -hmm. well and i think that our our focus in the classroom too about talking about root cause analysis and really kind of peeling back the layers of a challenging situation and getting to the root cause, I think is, we talk about it in the classroom, and then like you're saying, they see it when they're working with our residents. If we're struggling with the residents, if we're having issues, we're going to sit down as a team. And in the environments where I worked, when I would report a problem, that was my responsibility. That was it. I, I would say this is an issue, and then the nurses would huddle and talk about what needs to happen. Whereas here, the intention is that if you report a problem, come with answers too. come with ideas and thoughts as to how we can fix this. And let's fix it as a group rather than leaders and nurses who are just going to fix the problem. Let's all work together and, and come up with a solution. Mm-hmm. Well, exactly. and something else too. I'm sorry. No, don't no, go ahead, Katie. I was going to say something else too is as our leadership team, we all started as caregivers and really have that at the core heart of what we do in our leadership role. And we are present not only to our caregiving staff, but to our residents and their families daily. We spend our time not in an office, but in the homes, on the floors, actually helping to care for our residents, to be Mm -hmm. a part of that front line, too. so our caregivers have easy access to that support when there is that need. You know, dementia doesn't just stay in one phase, as we all know. It's ever-changing, and it can be changing from moment to moment and day to day, and we're there to help navigate that right alongside our caregivers. And I love that. I think it, I think that is such a powerful benefit to everyone. I mean, you know, one of the things we hear about now in the job market is people don't feel purposeful and they don't feel appreciated for the work that they do. And when you work in an environment when it's opened and, you know, your your supervisor gets it because they'll, they'll come out and help, you know, they'll, they'll come out and support you. They see what your job is versus, you know, in a lot of positions, supervisor doesn't even know who the heck you are. 
You know, they, they've yeah. not met you or they've spoken to you briefly, but someone else is going to handle the training. And we end up getting so siloed and separated that we don't really understand what makes the wheel go round and, mm-hmm. and, and what makes a comfortable environment. And I, I think that that's a huge mistake um, that we are seeing, you know, in in all areas of of industry mm-hmm. and business. Katie, let's talk a little bit about using essential oils. I love essential oils. I know a lot of people um, used to think, oh, that's kind of tabooy, you know, this holistic thing, <laughs> which is all about. Zach mentioned the flower garden with the lavender. I mean, our yes. senses take in this stuff all the time, and you know, you guys have really done well with understanding what senses um, can can pick up and what can change through through these oils. So but I, I'll let you explain what they're about and how you use them and why. Sure. When I started back in 2003, we essential oils were already a part of the everyday life of our residents. They were, we had a core group of oils that we were taught what they helped with and how we could use them with our residents. And after coming on board and working with it and seeing these benefits and seeing the oils really make an impactful change for our residents in their lives, um, we came together as a team and decided we need to figure out a way that we could use these even better. So we started to add them into their daily care plan routine. So all of our residents are touched by essential oils um, at least twice a day while they're having their morning cares provided for them and with them, and again in the evening. And it goes beyond just knowing what an essential oil does and the smell, but it's really truly understanding this oil works best if I apply it to their feet or I'm going to put lavender in their belly button before they go to bed at night because that's going to help them sleep better at night. Um, And looking at, you know, where it's placed and what we're using. And those plans change as our residents change and as they progress and their needs change, our caregivers are really in tune to that and they can share you know, I don't think that this oil is working well at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're a little anxious a little earlier in the day. Can we try it then? Um, So there's flexibility in that. And the other thing is really having support from an outside person that also knows um, essential oils really well. We have partnered uh, in the past with Jody Bagleen, and she's a certified clinical aromatherapist. Um, and she's working not only in residential environments in um, the Midwest and in Minnesota. She's based uh, out of Osseo, um, but helping everybody to kind of see the benefits of this. I think essential oils work really well, too, when there's that one-on-one approach with things. Um, we all need some individualized time together, and the oils help in doing that, Um And we just continue to look for ways that we can integrate not only essential oils, but other holistic um, pieces to care, hydration, exercise, music, things that we know are impactful for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's beautiful. I, you know, in other communities, I, I see uh, in some a hesitancy of using that because people aren't trained and they don't know how. Um, but, you know, oils can be used in so many different ways, too, that I don't think people mm-hmm. understand from diffusing into the air. So you can smell them to, you know, adding them into lotions and, you know, just doing hand massage and things. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's it's absolutely, absolutely endless. When when is it time to consider residential care with with English rose? That's something everyone struggles with. Is oh, when do we do this? Yes, <laughs> I think struggling to reach out to find support when you are a caregiver, a family caregiver, is something that everybody um, really puts a lot of thought into because we don't want to have our loved ones feel like we can't provide that for them anymore. Um, But we know through 
experience and through the experience of others that family caregivers can't do it by themselves. It's hard. It's stressful for them. Um, we often find that a lot of families, when they do choose to come to English Rose and they do choose um, residential care, the first thing that they usually say is, we wish we would have done this a long time ago. Um, my loved one could have benefited from this type of an environment a long time ago. Um, as a journey goes with everybody, it's all individual. Um, I would say when you get to that point where you may have a little extra home care in your home and supporting you and your loved one, um, and you know that it's starting to become difficult and you're needing more support, that would be a good time to reach out and start looking to see um, if, if that is the time. You know, and coming to see an environment like English Rose, um, so the people can share what it's all about with you. And it takes away some of that fear and that thought process of this is a nursing home when it's not. It's really a home and it's an extension of their home um, is a really good time to start looking. Yeah. And I would say not only an extension of, of their home, but an, an extension of their family. I always call it family yes. by choice when staff are well-trained and they get it. You know, they're mm -hmm. not there to, look down on you because you don't visit enough or run over you because they they now do it better or whatever. And sometimes you, you see those attitudes um, or you feel mm -hmm. that. And they might not even exist, but you just feel it because of the guilt. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the care received is exceptional. Um, and I would, you know, I would say for families, you know, don't wait till the last minute to to search out. Either get yourself educated on what's available, so when the time is right, you've built those relationships, and that's mm -hmm. that's something that you don't have to tackle. Because if someone takes a fall and he has a hip replacement and he maybe can't recover and now needs to go someplace with a little bit more care, you have mm -hmm. that out of the way. You've got that settled in your mind, and I think that. Being able to build the rapport with uh, the staff and be able to visit, and, and I know we have constraints with COVID, is, is very important. Uh, well, I want to make sure that I sneak in your contact information here, um, but I do have one other question I want to ask, but I want to make sure we <laughs> get this. So the website for English Rose is EnglishRoseSuite.com, EnglishRoseSuite.com. You can find them on Facebook under English Rose Suites. Um, and on Twitter, under E-N-G-L-I Rose Suites, and on um, LinkedIn and Instagram also as English Rose Suites. So, um, again, fabulous job you guys are doing. Um, Zach, is there anything really quick that, that we missed that we should, we should uh, make sure people know about? You know, I just, I, to jump onto the tail end of what Katie just said, I do think that, you know, that I've never seen someone move in too early. And I don't think mm -hmm. that you, I don't want to say you can move in too late, but I do think that, um, you know, when that individual is able to move in and that transition is smooth, you really give permission back to a family member to be that son or that daughter again. And that's something I've heard so many times after, uh, you know, they move their mother or father in they're allowed to be daughter again. They're allowed to be son again. And it's that normal relationship of coming to see their parent um, that I think people really miss when caring for a loved one at home or caring for a loved one um, by having home care or somebody come in. Um, I, I think giving permission back to family members to be that loved one again is, is a powerful thing. Well, and I think too, when people move in earlier, they, um, they have more opportunities to connect and how they want their care to go. Um, I, I know mm -hmm. several individuals who have chosen to move out sooner because they didn't ever want to get to that point where they felt like they were a burden or overstressing their family. I also mm -hmm. want to mention, I love when, when you guys had talked about, you want people there for their whole life. So you work with hospice, you work with palliative care, 
Um, because mm-hmm. some communities, people are like, oh, we can't handle that anymore, and then they have to move again. So in wrapping up, I just want to thank you both so much. This conversation went fast because it was informative and um, it was engaging. And I appreciate everything you do at English Rose Suites. And I would really highly recommend people check out EnglishRoseSuites.com and uh, give them a call and learn more. Thanks, everybody. And, again, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.